Good morning, everyone. Welcome to, I believe it's Tuesday morning. I keep losing track these days. I don't know about you guys, but one day is just like the other. So anyways, we are on chapter 12 of Gwyneth Ever After in my, I've decided to call it the quarantine reading series because I'm not feeling very creative with titles right now. Um, it will do. So quarantine reading series, chapter 12, Gwyneth Ever After. I hope this is finding you all doing well. We have another sunny day here, so I'm going to go out and do a little bit more yard work. Oh, that reminds me, while I'm thinking of it, I, I'm going to change the time of this. Now that I've got you all trained for 8 o'clock on, you know, first thing in the mornings, um, I'm going to switch our time because it's so nice and it's getting rather warm in the afternoons here now. Uh, Giant Dog and I prefer walking when it's a little bit cooler and quieter. So we're going to be doing our walks first thing in the morning and I'm going to shift doing the readings until after lunch. So you have been forewarned. I will put up a, a post on my Facebook page to the same effect um, when I think of it this afternoon. But we will be doing this at one o'clock in the afternoons uh, Eastern time instead of our current eight o'clock. Uh, and that will accommodate like, getting me and Giant Dog out on the road before the uh, the heat of the day hits and he starts to complain. <laughs> I don't like it either, honestly. We prefer the cooler weather. Uh, although I love spring. I do love spring, not kidding. And I'm looking forward to those lazy days on the terrace. But, you know. Uh, oh, and I might even be able to shift our readings outside and you can listen to the birds back me up. <laughs> so, uh, again, one o'clock in the afternoon. So that's when we'll be doing this from now on. So I hope that, uh, and that's Eastern time, by the way. So I hope that that suits everybody. Maybe we'll get a few, uh, few other people joining us for it, too. And now, Chapter 12 of Gwyneth Ever After. Gwyn sat on the closed toilet seat watching Maggie swim like a mermaid in the bathtub. Chin propped in hand and elbow resting on knee, she listened to the sounds drifting to her down, from down the hallway. It felt so odd sitting here while someone else tended her child. No, that wasn't quite true. Many times Sandy or another friend had pitched in with the kids' evening routine, and she'd listened to them without this strange hollowness beneath her ribs. No, this was different. Maggie drew her attention to her swimming attempts, and Gwyn dutifully watched and praised, but her attention soon wandered again, drawn by the voices from Nicholas's room. The high-pitched giggles and shrieks of her little boy mingled with the deep tenor belonging to Gareth. She sucked in a quick breath. That was it. Nicholas had never had a man ready him for bed before. Sandy's husband, Rob, had played ball with him in the backyard or taken him fishing on occasion, but he'd never participated in more intimate family routines. No man ever had. Gwyn's dates had been rare at best, had never amounted to anything approaching serious, and had never, ever touched her children's lives. Nicholas laughed again. Gwyn's heart constricted. Katie came in to brush her teeth, pausing to give her an enormous hug. Gwyn returned the gesture in surprise. What was that for? You looked sad, Katie said. I wanted to make you happy. I'm not sad, sweetie, Gwyn denied with a tiny laugh. I have you and Maggie and Nicholas. How could I possibly be sad? But thank you for the hug anyway. You and Maggie and Nicholas but never any man. She'd been so busy protecting her children that she'd never stopped to consider that she might have deprived them too, until now. Right, here's another one for teeth, Gareth said, making an appearance in the bathroom doorway with a giggling pajamaed Nicholas slung over his shoulder. Where shall I dump him? In the bathtub, Maggie shouted, joining in her brother's laughter. Gareth glanced at Quinn. I see the oatmeal bath is working magic, he observed. He swung Nicholas off his shoulder and set him on a stool beside Katie, who handed him his toothbrush. Gwyn pulled herself together, tucking her thoughts away until she could take them out and examine them again later, when it was safe to do so, when Gareth was gone. It generally does as long as they remain in it, and as long as the spots are in the right places. Poor Katie had most of hers on her face. Those were a little hard to soak in a tub, she grimaced at the memory. Don't most kids get the get this at the same time as their siblings, Gareth asked? Weren't the twins born yet? 
Yes, but they were only a few months old and they managed to avoid it. At the time, it was a blessing. It was my first year on my own. I'm not sure I could have handled all three. Gwyn tapped Nicholas on the shoulder and held out her hand for his toothbrush. He handed it over obediently and opened his mouth for her to continue the brushing job. She looked up at a quiet Gareth and found his dark brows almost converged over his nose. What? she asked. He shook his head, the frown clearing. Nothing, he said. But he somehow managed to convey the impression of the exact opposite. Gwyn went back to brushing Nicholas's teeth acutely aware of Gareth's eyes following her every movement. Katie finished her own teeth, drumped her, dropped her brush into the holder on the counter, and sidled past Gwyn. She paused to drop a kiss on top of Maggie's head. Night, Mags. Hope you're better soon. She looked hopefully at Gwyn. Can you still read me a story, Mummy? Of course, sweetie. We'll read the next chapter. Gwyn watched her trot off with a wide, happy grin, then glanced at Gareth. Harry Potter, she explained. Sandy gave it to her for her birthday, and we're almost done. All right, bud, she said to Nicholas. You're done. Rinse and spit, then have a drink. A small one. Nicholas complied, then turned to Gareth. Ready, he announced, sliding his small hand into the man's. We can read the Grinch, Gareth looked doubtful. Isn't it a bit early for Christmas stories? Gwyn laughed. Are you kidding? We read that one year round. You ought to try it on a sticky July afternoon. She leveled a severe look at her son and reminded him, One story, Nicholas, and no hassling Gareth. Gwyn dried off Maggie to the accompaniment of Gareth's deep voice drifting in from the twins' room. She slathered her daughter's, daughter's spots with calamine lotion, then dressed her in fresh pajamas. Together they tiptoed into the bedroom, finding Katie drawn there as well and settled onto Maggie's bed to listen to the rest of the story, brought to magical life in a way that Gwyn had never achieved. The story ended, and Gareth looked up at them all from the rocking chair, his eyes twinkling. What's this, a whole audience? We couldn't help ourselves, Gwyn said. That was marvelous. You were even better than Auntie Sandy, Katie told him. High praise indeed, Gwyn said. Gwyn, Sandy has been the world's best storyteller around here for years. Gareth chuckled. My agent will be pleased to know I'm making a reputation for myself. He looked down at Nicholas, settled into the crook of his arm, and handed him the book. I think that this makes it your bedtime, my friend. Nicholas took the book and slid off Gareth's lap. He cast a sly, pleading glance at Gwyn. Just one more, he asked. Gwyn raised an eyebrow. With a defeated sigh, her son crossed the room to replace the book on the shelf. Minutes later, both he and Maggie were tucked into bed, and Gwyn began the final kiss-and-hug routine, or what used to be the final one. Tonight, as she leaned over Maggie, her daughter whispered a request in her ear. Gwyn smiled past a lump in her throat. I'll ask, she said. She looked over at Gareth, waiting in the doorway. Maggie would like to know if she could please have a kiss and a hug from you, too. Gratified surprise flickered across Gareth's expression, and he detached himself from the doorpost. I would be honored, he said. He duly delivered a kiss hug to first Maggie, and then at Nicholas's demand to him as well, before joining Gwyn at the door. She pulled the door partway closed, reminded Maggie to call her if she woke up, and turned to find Gareth leaning against the wall, his arms crossed over his chest. Her heart skipped a beat, then, when she met his dark gaze, it skipped several more. Visions of their parting scene the night before danced through her head. She smoothed damp palms against her skirt. How long do you think she'll sleep? Gareth asked, breaking the spell as he nodded towards Maggie's door. If I'm lucky, an hour or two. I'll just keep giving her baths as she needs them, and then bring her into bed with me when I come up later. You're going to be tired tomorrow. Nothing I haven't been before, I can assure you, she said dryly. Parenthood and exhaustion are synonymous, didn't you know? A shuttered expression crossed Gareth's eyes, so fast it was gone before she really had time to register it. He changed the subject. How are you, how are Nicholas and Katie getting to school in the morning? My neighbor is chauffeuring Nicholas to and from kindergarten for me, and Katie's friend's mother will pick her up on the way. Good, he nodded, seeming satisfied that she'd covered all the bases. Are you ready for a cup of tea or something? 
the or something held distinct appeal, but Gwyn managed to hold her tongue. I'd love a cup of tea, but are you sure you have time? I don't want to keep you if you have other plans. Are you trying to get rid of me? Heat crept across Gwyn's cheeks. Of course not. I thought I meant you tuck Katie in. I'll put on the kettle. She was only too happy to make good her escape. That is the end of chapter 12. And uh, hang on, how long is chapter 13 here? Shall we continue chapter 13? Why not, right? We'll just keep going for a bit. Chapter 12 is a bit on the short side, so here you go. Bonus chapter 13. Gareth watched a wisp of steam drift from the kettle. On the counter beside the stove, a tray stood ready. He scented a baleful glance. Sugar, milk, spoons, teapot, and one cup. One, because he still held the other in a death grip while common sense wrestled romantic fantasy, fancy. One, because no matter how much he wanted to stay, he shouldn't. Should never have come in the first place. He rubbed his stubbled jaw with one hand and scowled at the offending mug he held in the other. What in the hell did he think he was playing at here anyway? Why couldn't he just be sensible and walk away? Breaking promises to Catherine, keeping secrets from Gwyn, he raked his hand through his hair. It wasn't as if he hadn't met attractive, sexy, intriguing women before, because he had many of them. Some had been mistakes from the very start. Some had made a deeper impression than others. A metallic hiss vibrated through the copper kettle on the stove, and steam whisked from its spout. But none had ever been like Gwyn. None had surprised him with a quirky honesty as enchanting as it was refreshing. None had made him, with a simple note of weariness in her voice, want to drop his own life so he could make hers a little easier. None had made all his complications fade away with nothing more than her smile. And none had ever made him stand in a kitchen debating the addition of a second cup to a tea tray. He hefted the cup in his hand. Well, Connor, you know you want to, and you know you shouldn't. What's it going to be? Things would be so much simpler if he could just be... Oh, I'm sorry, I have a Winston here. He's rubbing against the book. Come on, bud. Off you go. <laughs> Seriously, cat. Sorry, Winston has left the desk. <laughs> Things would be so much simpler if he could just be honest with Gwyn, if he hadn't given his word to Catherine to keep Amy a secret until Amy herself decided to make the relationship public. But with so much at stake, he would not, could not, break the first promise, however indirectly made, he'd ever given his daughter, not for ever anyone. So, did he put this second cup on the tray, continue to deceive Gwyn for the moment, see where this spark led, and hope that she understood when she eventually found out? Or did he turn around, walk away, keep his promises intact, and for the rest of his life, wonder, what if? Gareth sighed. Bloody hell. When he put it like that, he set the cup on the tray. For the second evening in a row, Gwyn's belly twisted into knots as she descended the stairs. She couldn't remember the last time she'd felt so distracted. Lord, she'd stumbled so many times over reading to Katie that her poor daughter had finally heaved an exasperated sigh, taken the book out of her hands, and told her they'd continue tomorrow. But not even the resulting guilt had stilled Gwyn's thoughts of Gareth. He waited for her in the sitting room. A tea tray sat on the wooden trunk, her CD of box violin concertos played quietly in the background, and Gwyn's stomach did three complete flips before she even stepped down into the room. He looked up from a magazine as he wa she walked around the trunk to join him on the couch. Break time? Until the next round, Gwyn agreed. She motioned at the tray. <laughs> Sorry, now you might he see his nose. We have a, a, a gizmo that's come to visit. He's going to make his pass across in front of us. Whoop! Almost fall off the desk. He's not the most graceful cat. Okay. Give me two seconds. He's leaving too. <laughs> Told you. I kind of thought it would be a little bit quieter this morning because everybody was in their beds when I started. But no, things are never quiet with four cats in the house. Okay, so until the next round, Gwyn agreed. 
She motioned at the tray. Thank you for making the tea. You're welcome. I won't stay long. I know you have work to do tonight. Not nearly as much as I'd have if you hadn't taken over the kids. She perched on the edge of the couch, her, ha her hands alternately pleating and smoothing the fabric of her skirt. You're very good with them, you know. And they're very good kids, he returned lightly. He leaned forward and lifted the teapot from the tray. He poured a little into one of the mugs. Strong enough for you? Gwyn nodded. He filled her cup, added the bit of milk she requested, and passed it to her. Stirring it, she watched him pour his own. Curiosity finally got the better of her. Do you have any of your own? Gareth raised a dark brow. Any what? Kids, you're so natural with them. I thought maybe... She betrayed off. Gareth's hand hovered over his cup for an instant, holding a teaspoon of sugar. Then he dumped the white crystals into the milky liquid and stirred. I've never considered much uh, myself much in the way of father material, he said brusquely. Surprise made her speak honestly and without thinking. Are you kidding? You'd be wonderful. Then it occurred to her how her words might sound, coming from a single mother. Her face heated. That is, I mean... Gareth slanted her a crooked, reassuring smile. I know what you mean, and thank you. The strains of Bach floated into the awkward silence between them. Gwyn rested her elbows on her knees and cradled her cup in her hands. Can I ask you something? Gareth's voice sounded studiously casual. Gwyn stilled. So they'd come to the personal things at last, had they? She sipped her tea. Well, she supposed she'd started it. Of course. Where is he now? She didn't pretend not to understand. Somewhere on the planet, one would presume, she said, her voice devoid of expression. He doesn't see the kids. Jack isn't what anyone would consider much in the way of father material. What happened? Gwyn sent him a sidelong glance. You don't really want to hear the sordid details of my life, do you? She asked in a dry attempt at levity. Gareth's eyes flicked to hers, brooding and intense. Humor me. She held his gaze a moment, then looked down into her cup again. Jack decided he couldn't handle the responsibilities of being a father. He went, to get, he went out to get milk one night, a week after Nicholas and Maggie were born, and called three days later to tell me he wouldn't be coming home again. Gareth frowned. You must have had problems before that, she snorted softly. To this day, I can't remember the slightest warning sign. We had the usual arguments, but I thought things were pretty normal. He was thrilled when Katie was born, took her everywhere with him. And when we found out I was expecting twins, he called everyone he knew to tell them the news. Apparently, once they were born, however, he panicked. He said he could handle one child, maybe even two, but three, especially with twins, were more than he could deal with. He, she took another swallow of tea and tried again to lighten the conversation. See, I told you you didn't want to hear the details. Did he? Does he ever ask to see them? He did once, about a year after he left. My lawyer notified him I was seeking sole custody. The next day he turned up on the doorstep with his new girlfriend. She wanted to see the kids for herself before they decided whether or not he should sign the papers. Gareth muttered a harsh expletive. G Gwyn shot him a wicked grin. Not to worry, she said. Nicholas had the flu that day. He threw up all over the girlfriend's designer suit the minute she picked him up. Two days later, Jack signed over custody. A muscle flexed in Gareth's jaw. It must have been hard on the kids. The comment sounded harsher than she might have expected, as if it had been torn from him against his will, and Gwyn sent him a curious look. Maggie and Nicholas never knew him, she pointed out. But it was hard on Katie. It was three years before she stopped asking when she when he was coming home. She paused, feeling her throat constrict. She hadn't been down this road in a long time, she reflected, and for good reason. Katie thought she'd done something wrong, something to make Daddy angry. She cried herself to sleep for months. I think I could have ripped him apart on those nights. She swallowed the lump that accompanied the memories. Stop, she told herself. You've said too much already. But Gareth's questions hadn't finished. What if he wants to come back into their lives one day? He turned to look at her, his eyebrows a single dark slash above his flat gaze. Will you let him? 
a question she'd asked herself many, many times, and one she'd been so very, very glad she hadn't yet had to answer. She thought of her tiny daughter's tiny body shaking with sobs, the times she'd had to leave her little girl to weep alone at night while she'd tended the needs of newborn twins. Tears blurred her vision, threatened to overflow. She blinked them away, appalled at her weakness. Any man who can do to do what Jack did to Katie doesn't deserve a second chance, she said, her voice steady. Cold, he walked away from his own kids and never looked back, never called, never dropped by to see them. It was as if he forgot they ever existed. Despite her rapid blinking efforts, a tear escaped and slid down her cheek. She swiped it away with the back of one hand. So to be honest, I don't know if I'd let him. I don't know if I could. Long seconds ticked by. Then Gareth reached to set his cup on the trunk with careful deliberateness. It's late, he said. I'll see myself out. A hollow spot formed beneath Gwyn's ribs. That was it? No comment, no nothing? She watched him rise. He paused as he reached the kitchen door, looking back but not meeting her gaze. Don't forget to lock the door behind me. She stared after him, listening to the retreat of his footsteps, the opening of the door, the finality of its closing again. So, the fantasy had come to an end, wreathed in the flames of reality. She closed her eyes. Damn, she'd known this would happen if things turned too, per turned too personal. She just hadn't expected it to sting quite so much. End of chapter 13. We will move on to chapter 14 tomorrow in our quarantine reading series. Um, reminder, for those of you who uh, tuned in late, we will be doing the readings a little bit later in the day at one o'clock uh, Eastern time in the afternoon so that Giant Dog and I can go out and get our rocks in first thing in the morning while it's still a little bit cooler and he's not too warm and mosquitoes aren't out yet. <laughs> so. Um, so we'll start that uh, as of tomorrow and continue going forward. And uh, apart from that, the whole list of things I said I was going to do yesterday, I didn't do much of any of them. I did put the, the hippopotamus I was crocheting together, uh, posted a picture of that up on my Facebook page if you want to have a look at it. He turned out really, really cute. And uh, I'm going to be starting a new project today, uh, this evening. Um, still hoping to maybe get out and at least do some tidying in the yard, maybe sweep a terrace. We'll see. We'll see how far this ambition of mine lasts. It's always good first thing in the morning. Another reason I'll move the reading to the afternoon because I always seem to have more ambition first thing in the morning. I get lots of things done and then join you for a reading and I don't kind of really lends itself to relaxing for the afternoon. Uh, also a reminder that I am reading from my book Sins of the Angels, my uh, dark urban fantasy. Uh, warning for those of you who are not familiar with it, it is a very dark urban fantasy. There's, uh, It's rather graphic, there is strong language, um, but that happens over on my Lydia Hawk Books Facebook page, Hawk with an E. Um, I'll put a, a link in for that again today so that if you are interested, you, you can join me there. We've got two chapters up already and uh, I'll be reading from chapter three today there. So take care. Let me know how you guys are doing. Drop me a comment. Say hi. Let me know what you're up to. Let me know you're surviving. And uh, stay strong. Stay safe. Stay sane. Stay home. And uh, join me again tomorrow for more Cats Interrupting Readings. <laughs> Take care. Bye.